welcome, David. Uh, thanks for coming along to give a, a presentation. And, um, I, will, I will leave it to you. <laughs> Kia ora tato. Um, yeah, I, I could say a little bit more about where I come from um, in this regard. I did my master's with Kate McMillan at Victoria many years ago on asylum seeking policy in New Zealand um, and then ended up over in Oxford doing a doctorate there in sort of political judgment and political decision making, um, which was inspired a little bit by my work on asylum policy, especially the way that politicians use moral reasoning as a way to justify restrictions of borders um, and restrictions of asylum seekers specifically. Um, but yeah, <laughs> my background is in geography, so I've always had these interests in, in sort of geography themes like migration and climate policy. Um, but yeah, I tend to look at it now with a lens of um, political theory, um, which I will describe a bit shortly. Um, uh, maybe if you flick over to the, so. <laughs> yeah. So, so the topic for today is this idea of fear borders, which, which I used as this framework for um, this collected edition uh, that was published last year during the election. It was, um, there was 10 authors for this book. And uh, I picked this theme because, um, yeah, I was worried about the way that the political debate was going and I wanted to introduce other perspectives which weren't necessarily um, in the mainstream media much and just try and give a lift to, to different uh, perspectives on migration policy. Um, so I picked this idea of fear borders as a, as a really broad general umbrella under which to um, incorporate and involve a lot of different authors with different perspectives. Um, so, the, but, but what I'm doing today is really taking that concept of fear borders and, and not leaving it so much as an open umbrella, but trying to sort of pin down on what that actually might entail as a, as a more of a normative concept. Um, so yeah, I mean, the difference really, I guess, is the question mark in fear borders there. It's like the question was, you know, are our borders fear? But um, today I'll be taking the question mark away and, and treating it more as a declarative of, you know, what would fear borders look like? Um, if, if such a thing makes sense. And I'm, I'm exploring the concept and I've got my own reservations about whether it really works as a normative concept, but maybe you can all help me with um, identifying some of the shortcomings in due course. So. Um, so I just wanted to start off as well, just by clarifying my methodology a little bit. Um, this is really an exercise in normative political theory. So, um, I'm really making a prescriptive claim, but, it, but also a, not just prescriptive in the sense of imposing things on people, but I'm trying to come up with a model that people might agree with. So that's kind of the difference between, you know, the normative and just the merely prescriptive. prescriptive. Um, but even within normative political theory, I, I treat myself, the, the, the approach that I take, I call political realism. So I sort of align with the tradition um, of political realist theory, which means that I'm not proposing an ideal theory. I'm not proposing that, you know, we could set up a framework of fear borders as some utopian because some sort of utopian model. Um, I don't even know what a utopia of borders would actually really look like. It seems a bit of a strange notion. So this is not really a, a, an attempt to try and come up with an ideal. Um, it's also not non-ideal theory, which is where you take an ideal and then you make some compromises with reality. Um, I'm not attempting to do that. I'm not saying that the fear borders is the perfect way to go. And if we were to just sort of make some little compromises and concessions here and there, it might look like this. What I'm doing is political realism, um, which I take to be something like the following, that it's drawing upon materials of political reality. So I'm starting really at, at the bottom, working in a bottom up fashion, um, looking at norms that are around. And um, so that's why I also describe it as a localized conception. So I'm really thinking around, you know, values that are operating in a particular space that I'm discussing this in, particularly in the context of the New Zealand um, politics. Um, that's not to say that I'm not using ideals and values, but I'm using them strategically. And, you know, appealing to things like fairness, not because I think it's some sort of universally appeal, but because I think it has 
certain kinds of purchase and timeliness and relevance to this particular community. Um, and in that regard, I, I'm sort of oriented by my own values. I don't try to subtract myself from ethical thinking as some sort of ideal theorists do and claim to be making appeals of universal rationality. I'm admitting that, you know, this is involving my own values, but also values of people and my assessments of what they are. Um, so, yeah, in that sense, I, I don't think this is a utopia that I'm proposing, but I would hope that at the very least, it would be a step away from a lot of the unfairness and injustice that um, this framework can identify um, with existing migration policy today. So, um, and the other point really is that uh, this, this attempt to do, to, to sort of try a different framework is, is really comes a lot from my dissatisfaction with the way that normative political theory tends to address the question of the ethics of borders, which is usually around this open, closed um, framework. Um, so some will argue that borders need to be open and um, that people should have free movement across borders. And then other people argue that actually ethically, you know, closed borders are, are justified, that there are ethical justifications for closing borders and restrict, restricting movement. And so a lot of normative political theory um, operates in this space. Not entirely, there's also no borders um, kind of approaches, um, but I'm gonna just focus on this for now. Um, part of my dissatisfaction with this is that, you know, open, closed, are not in themselves moral values. They're really more descriptive terms like up or down or in and out. Um, they don't immediately convey their evaluative content, their ethical content. Um, I wouldn't take that point too far because um, these descriptive terms can start to um, be imbued by or sort of, you, you know, they can start to carry evaluative content like, like left and right does in politics, you know, they, they become immediately sort of ethically infused words and increasingly, um, you know, I hear this conversation that, you know, our politics these days are based around a binary of openness and closeness. And so you start to see this idea of open and closed being ethically infused, but nevertheless, there's still the sense that the, the, um, the values aren't at face, the values aren't at face value as such. Uh, they're, they're really at a second order. And so that goes to the second point here that, you know, to understand the ethical work that's going on, you have to really appeal to other values that are hanging behind open closeness. I'm sure we're familiar with these arguments in a loose sense that open borders are justified in terms of the right to freedom of movement the sanctity of individual liberty, if you're, a, you know, come, come at it from a liberal perspective, perhaps, you know, you argue for open borders on the grounds of equality of opportunity or the brute luck of birthplace, or you make utilitarian arguments that um, borders impede the maximization of global happiness or, or in increased global GDP, perhaps. Uh, there's also pacifist arguments that, that borders are essentially violent and, and coercive and therefore not justified um, ethically. There's also arguments that borders are undemocratic or intrinsically statist or colonialist or racist or sexist or ableist. And so behind this idea of open borders, there's all of these different kinds of justifications which are you know, potentially mutually inconsistent and competing. And the same is true on the other side. Um, closed borders also has a range of different arguments and what makes it really complicated and quite murky is that a lot of the, the justifications for closed borders can also come from the same um, ethical framework. So, you know, there's the classic debate that liberalism in regards to borders is kind of paradoxical because there's some liberal arguments which support open borders, but then someone like David Miller, for instance, who um, incidentally, <laughs> I used to, used to have to listen to him quite a lot when I was at Oxford doing my PhD and his arguments around borders, he will use liberal and egalitarian and democratic arguments to argue for closed borders insofar as his argument that the only existing instances of liberal democratic societies are all based around nation states and therefore um, 
closed borders are justified because that, that, that is the only circumstances in which these ideals can um, proliferate. Um, there's all sorts of problems about this argument. I think um, a lot of them are empirical issues, I think, but like the point still stands that you get this real messiness in the open closed um, framework where it's hard to tell which ethical frameworks are going to, where they're going to land. Uh, to use an example, recently in New Zealand, Here's a quote from David Seymour of the Act Party, so a libertarian party which ought to be, you know, very much open in favour of open borders and sceptical of the state controlling people's movement. But he says all immigrants should accept the most basic values of New Zealand society. If they don't like or agree with the most basic of rights, they can find somewhere else to go. Fundamentalist Islam is incompatible with New Zealand values. So you have this appeal on liberal grounds to closed borders and so it becomes quite confusing in this debate as to where ethics are going to land um, and so that's that's the last point around this of my dissatisfaction with the open closed framework is that it, it's quite misleading in reality and in theory um, and you get this you know with, even with open borders arguments that as soon as the the open border advocate um, you know, argues for open borders, suddenly all these exceptions start to creep in, like, you know, open borders, but not if there's invading armies or not if there's threats to natural, national security or threats to the community, uh, such as drug smugglers or international criminals. And it becomes a slippery slope where all of these exceptions start to get added to an open borders claim. Um, you know, you start to get economic threats like unskilled workers, uh, or, or threats to the public health system and so on and so on. And it's all um, cloaked in this, you know, we are an open society, but nevertheless, you know, there's all these exceptions that are part of it. And it, it starts to, be, and then this, the same happens with closed borders as well. It's closed borders, except if they're people who share our values or accept people who are economically productive. And, um, you know, it, it becomes to this, there's a sense of false advertising about these open closed justifications um, and you get to this point you know New Zealand you know positions itself as an open society with open borders and, and free movement but it's sometimes it's um, it's hard to know really if New Zealand is a society with open borders that's riddled with exceptions or whether it's a closed society with closed borders which is riddled with exceptions they both sort of end up roughly in the same place and it doesn't really help people to understand that like really the way that borders operate is through a really complex system of inclusions and exclusions of invitations and deterrence and of openness and closeness and all of this sort of operating in the same space and the open closed framework tends to think that you could fall on one side or the other whereas the reality of borders that we see is really um, a really messy mixture of, of, of both of these dynamics operating at once. So, uh, yeah. So my solution is, is to bring a moral value straight up to the forefront rather than um, have the moral values operating at the, at the second order. Um, so so this, is what I'm, this is why I was trying to introduce um, this idea of fear borders is it brings the ethical value up, to, up front, makes it obvious. Um, it refocuses the argument on the ethical implications of a social fact, the social fact being the existence of a border and not on whether that fact should exist or not. So you're talking about, you know, the ethics of the, of the border itself, um, not so much about its existence. Uh, and yeah, it acknowledges that point that I made before that in reality and theory, the borders are open and closed and crossed and not crossed simultaneously. And that's really this question of who is and isn't able to cross and then whether, whether we deem that fear or not, um, the restrictions that are being created or the opennesses that are being created by the border system that we happen to have and operate. So next slide. Um, so uh, here I'll just talk about fairness a little bit. What is fairness? It's a pretty loose concept um, and quite an indeterminate one. Um, this is a quote that I use in the book. I really 
it was it's sort of me trying to sum up all of this all of the things that I'd read about fairness and what it meant and this is what I came up with this um idea of a state of affairs that is acceptable to most parties even in the face of enduring and disagreement so the idea here is that something might be fair um even though you're not entirely satisfied or or content with the outcome like it might inconvenience you in some way but you can still nevertheless um you can still nevertheless recognize that it's that it's a fair outcome and you can accept it on those terms that it's fair um i'll talk shortly just a bit little bit about how that differentiates from something like justice where which tends to think of um you know the right ethical outcome is something which is morally complete and morally perfect and that you know, everybody ought to just agree and there should be no dissent. And fairness instead is a bit, is a bit more of a second best world where, you know, it, it might not be the ideal, but we can all sort of learn to live with it or we can accept it even though it's not the optimal outcome for everybody. Um, and I just also note, I say acceptable to most parties because um, good political realist that I am, I don't think that um, consensus and universal agreement is, is possible. So, so I'll always keep that, you know, possibility for dissensus in, in the definition. Um, and the other point about fairness is that I think it's predominantly or primarily a procedural concept. I don't think it's, it doesn't determine outcomes so much. It's a lot more about the process in the sense of a fair process um, and a due process and fair outcomes tend to be outcomes which are a consequence of that process, but it could be a range of different outcomes. So um, hopefully that'll become clearer shortly too. So um, I don't want to get too snarled up here on uh, political philosophy questions, but I guess I just did want to differentiate um, what I'm talking about with fairness with probably the most well-known conception of fairness in political theory, which is John Rawls's um, theory of justice is fairness. So he's, his theory of justice has a substantive side, so it definitely recommends a whole bunch of institutions and, and treats them as ones that we ought to all accept as reasonable people. But the bit that makes it fairness is this procedural element, this idea of the original position. So he has a story about how um, you know members of a, of a potential society will get together and they will debate what are the ideal institutions for the society not knowing where they're going to end up within the society so he argues that this kind of mechanism creates this process and this procedure by which people will arrive at um, a set of fair and ju just institutions um, but this is where john rawls is kind of trying to trying to package fairness into into the idea of justice and um especially this idea of fairness as a form of neutrality where we treat people as you know disembodied sort of rational agents and individuals who have reason and that can um you know choose what's best for them in in this kind of abstract theorizing um so that's his sort of notion of fairness as this procedure um but i'm much more attracted to a conception of fairness that um joseph karen's came up with in a book, um, Culture, Citizenship and Community. Uh, some of you may have know of Joseph Karens as an advocate of open borders himself. He wrote a um, very highly cited paper uh, <laughs> uh, on, on open borders, which has perhaps um, laid some of the grounds for the, you know, the debates of open and closed um, borders which I expressed my dissatisfaction with earlier um, but but he's, he's got a lot more going on and in, in sub subsequent work I mean he also considers himself a political realist of a kind um, and and this sort of idea that he uh, expresses in this book is very much reflective of that this idea of fairness is even-handedness so he argues against rules and um, the idea of fairness is impartiality and neutrality and instead, I argue for this idea of fairness as even handedness, where we treat everybody's interests and experiences and needs in an even handed way. And by this, he means, um, yeah, not 
not this kind of abstract neutrality where we abstract people out, um, but much more that we actually listen and that we we are curious about their experience and that we, as he says, says regard them concretely. So we really look and deep into their lives and see how um, things are going for them and try to understand uh, the consequences of policy for them in their lives um, as they're actually lived to obtain as much knowledge as we can about those lives and what they care about and then to address um, questions of policy in light of that really rich notion of their actual real life. Um, so that's his idea of fairness is even handedness. And so I've, I'm very much falling on that side of um, what fairness might mean. So that all of this. Um, uh, yeah, and so my other bit of clearing the <laughs> clearing the way for for the concept of fair borders is is just why fairness. Um, you know, you know why not appeal to something like justice or equality or. Uh, or liberty or all of these other political values why did i choose fairness in particular so the key thing and, and i guess this spoke especially to the political context um, last year during the election campaign is like what kind of arguments might make some headway um, in regards to convincing people that they do have a moral obligation and, and moral regard to my you know new migrants or potential migrants and um so the idea was to appeal to a to a value or a virtue which you know the new zealand community tends to hold or tends to think of itself as holding <laughs> um you know we have to always be careful about this this kind of thing because you know ascribing a value to everybody um can be a bit preposterous um but you know there's at least this notion of New Zealand as an imagined community, imagining itself to be a fair community and to, and to orientate its institutions and its norms around fairness as a sort of driving value for, for New Zealand society. So um, in that sense, there's a bit of a captive audience to appealing to fairness in regards to migration policy. You know, there's a potential there to say, well, if you really believe in fairness, then you couldn't possibly you know, stand by and support a migration policy that has these sorts of outcomes. So that's, that's part of the strategic reasoning behind um, appealing to this ideal. Um, another thing that, uh, about fairness, which I find attractive is that it's conceptually gross, <laughs> um, which I mean that it's just, it's, it's a really slippery um, concept. Um, there's a lot of different understandings of what fairness means and what fairness entails and I find that quite attractive because it, it actually is useful for starting a conversation and to, for holding a conversation about what fairness entails and especially holding that conversation with people who might not um, necessarily um, well, who, who, might, who might feel restrictive towards immigration for other sorts of reasons. Um, making these appeals to fairness, you can argue for a certain conception of fairness and, and sort of keep this debate going around what it means. And I think having the debate in itself is, is helpful and having the debate on these ethical terms, because then at least, you know, people are regarding other people as, you know, persons with um to, to which they owe some sort of ethical consideration which often is is very lacking in uh, migration debates um and the other thing i like about fairness is is that it's, it's something that i alluded to earlier that it's it's a bit morally incomplete um it doesn't ever really propose to satisfy everybody it just has it tends to have this idea of a fair procedure um and that kind of lead, you know, that might leave dissatisfaction, it might leave some inconvenience, it might leave other sorts of things. And so there's the sense of a moral remainder where, you know, the outcomes aren't morally perfect. Um, there might be actually, by the way that the border is implemented, there'll be, you know, even if it feels like that that particular border regime is justified, we can nevertheless recognize that there's a whole lot of harms or, whole lot of inconveniences that come out of that and so in a sense by acknowledging those moral remainders and acknowledging that that's almost a necessary part of 
any kind of um, institution of this nature, then it, then it opens itself up to being curious and, and to, to try to understand the moral remainders and ideally to try and minimize the negative effects of these, perhaps to uh, um, come up with forms of compensation or other ways to, to address some of the negative impacts of the institution, in that case, the border. Uh, yeah, so, so here, was a, here, here I can get into a few thoughts of what fear borders might actually um, entail. Um, so the first bit of this is, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with talking about a few procedural elements um, and then, which obviously, as I've said, is I think where a lot of the action lies with fairness. Um, and then I'll talk about a couple of substantive things after this. Um, so the first bit is that fair borders should possess a reasonable claim to fairness to all those affected by a border. Um, so that means people inside the border who aren't even crossing the border, even though the migration policy might have implications for them. Also people outside the border who, who might want to come in but may not be able to because of the way that the border is set up, but also people crossing the border who are going through those bordering processes um, by which they may or may not cross. Um, and so I think this is where that idea of fairness is even handedness that Karen's describes. That's what this sort of demands is that we give a thoroughgoing consideration to all affected parties. So inside, outside and, and across the border. Um, and, you know, there's a bit of a philosophical sleight of hand here, you know, when philosophers say this sort of thing about, you know, having a reasonable claim to fairness, they don't mean that you know, the, the border agency has to go and speak to everybody and to have this particular debate. Um, it's more that some consideration has been, has gone on to ensure that there is a reasonable claim of this kind that could be offered. Um, although how you institutionalize these sorts of things is, is um, an interesting question, which maybe we could talk about afterwards. Um, yeah, I was just trying to think of an example. I mean, something which has been upsetting me recently is the is the effects of the minimal health requirements on um, on migration policy in New Zealand and the way that um, you know there's been these cases, for instance, of children who have been um, you know not allowed visas or rights to stay because of existing health conditions, even when the rest of the family has. Um, has been given a right to remain or a, a right to enter. Um, I think like if, if this sort of fair borders framework is worth anything, it's gonna have to be able to identify that that is just a brutally unfair situation. Um, I, I get, yeah, I'm thinking of, you know, a recent case was Caitlin Davies and Geraldine who was, she had, was born with a global development disorder. Uh, um, so a developmental problem and even though her family had a right to stay here, she was here illegally because the immigration New Zealand hadn't um, given her a right to remain. I think, like, I think that's something which is unfair. I think probably most New Zealanders would agree with that, I think and I hope. Um, and I think that's, it's, it's also unfair, not just for, for Caitlin, the six-year-old girl, um, it's also unfair her, for her family who are inside all of the borders. Um, so, you know, even her exclusion has uh, a negative effect and an unfair effect on, on people who are inside the border. Um, and potentially, I think it has a really unfair effect on um, New Zealand citizens with disabilities who have no relation to uh, this particular person, Caitlin, um, because, you know, it's sort of, sort of conveys this, um, it, it sort of, yeah, it demonstrates a society that's not willing to even countenance giving healthcare to a, you know, a, sick, a severely disadvantaged six-year-old girl. And I think for people with disabilities who are in New Zealand, who even may not be crossing borders, you know, that is a, that's quite, probably quite an ominous and um, 
an unsettling thing to see, even, even if you are not crossing the border yourself, because it's sort of, there's an implication that perhaps there's an underlying reluctance to be providing health services to, um, to New Zealand citizens as well, if, if there was an excuse not to do so. Um, in, the, in this case, migration policy is, is that excuse. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's um, the, yeah, the unfairness can, can sort of bounce off in lots of different ways. Um, the, the other points, uh, fear borders are supported by reasons that have a strong claim to validity, to accuracy, to sincerity, to truthfulness. I won't say too much about this, but I guess I'm just, this is really me countering the, the thought that um, these kind of claims to support borders could be based on bad statistics or, or knowledge gaps, you know, which we see all the time in migration policy that these misunderstandings of the impacts or the scale or the, or the nature of migration nevertheless drive immigration policy. Um, so I'm saying that a fair border could never be, never be driven by um, that kind of misinformation. And here I'm just leaning on some of the values of ideal communication theory about you know what what a reasonable claim should should have um, as its property as its sort of yeah knowledge properties. Um, fair borders are information hungry and ceaselessly reflexive. That I guess th this as well is another way of what Karen's was talking about with fairness is even handedness in, the, in regard to re fairness entailing that people need to be treated concretely as their lives go. And in that case, you know, a border policy, a border regime, if it was fair, it would be really interested in how um, the, the regime is, is affecting on people's lives. It would, um, it would be reflexive on, on, on how you know international events or other kinds of policy are changing the way that um, the borders are are affecting people. Um, it would be interested both in quantitative and qualitative um, information gathering, um, and it would be interested in the effects of the borders um, onshore and offshore. Um, and yeah, the final point again, which I won't labour because I already mentioned it, was is that fear borders will acknowledge their own moral remainders. So that's part of the being information hungry is especially to even when a even when a particular border is justified by one kind of set of concerns, then um, it should be really curious about what sorts of effects that's having and whether that is creating moral hazards in a different direction. Um, and so here I've also, here's a few substantive elements just for consideration. And so here I'm kind of going beyond the procedural and thinking maybe a little bit about what some of the outcomes might be. Um, and I said before, you know, that I don't think fairness determines the outcomes. Um, so these are very much my opinions of what fairness would be and if, if, if I was arguing for fear out, you know, what would be fair outcomes, this is what I would be arguing for. But I accept that other people would have different conceptions of, of what fairness entails. So this would be, you know, it, this is very much set forth in a pluralist understanding. Um, and I think one thing is that fear borders, you know, one of the things I like about the fear borders idea is because you know, compared to the open closed borders is the open closed things tends to reify the idea of a national border. Um, whereas when you're thinking about fair borders, there's no real connection to a particular territory. Um, so it may well be that a fair border, you know, national borders really aren't that fair and that like, it would be much more fair to, to operate borders at different kinds of levels. Um, so it could be the city, cities, it could be sort of supranational regions, could be Rohi, um, other kinds of ideas of territory. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've been challenged on this point already about, you know, that creates all sorts of issues because, you know, our borders are very much built around nation states um, and that this raises all sorts of questions and I'm quite happy with that because that's just the way that the world is heading anyway. Um, there's a lot of different movement that 
and, and, and a lot of borders already exist within or outside of national borders, you know, borders already operate at a lot of different scales. So in a sense, this is just sort of acknowledging that and, um, and bringing those different kinds of borders um, under some ethical scrutiny. Um, the other thing I'd say is that borders ought to avoid cruelty. Um, this is a point I take from Judith Sklar, who thinks that this is just the really sort of basic foundation of liberalism is that actually just um, any institution ought to avoid cruelty wherever possible and re very much in that cruelty, the sense of cruelty where it's, you know, unjustified or arbitrary. And um, I think there's quite a lot of examples of that in migration policy um, already. Um, and so, yeah, I hope that the Fair Borders framework would shine a light on some of that cruelty. Um, another, another thought here was Nancy Fraser's idea of participatory parity, which I just find a really nice way of describing the idea of a fair go. Um, she doesn't quite put it in that language, but the idea is that, um, the idea is that, you know, all persons in a community should be able to have what she calls participatory parity. So, in the sense that um, whenever they're participating in public processes and participating in political processes, there should be some sort of parity there between them, but also recognizing there's lots of different ways that, that um, inequity, different ways that inequity can operate to make that parity um, not existing at the time. So, and the three aspects there are recognition, redistribution and representation. So, people may lack that participatory parity because, you know, they're not recognized in the, in the sense that their identities and their cultural identities aren't recognized and um, the particular needs that stem from that. And so that creates a disadvantage for them to participate in demo democratic processes. Um, the redistribution is the idea that economic imbalances can also reduce somebody's capacity to participate equally in, um, in democratic processes. And then also the idea of representation, which is obviously a really important one for talking about migration, the idea that different kinds of representate, um, yeah, different kinds of citizenship or non-citizenship entail different levels of representation and that can create different sorts of injustice. I mean, I think a great example in the New Zealand case is people who may have been here for many, many years, but on consecutive temporary work visas and so you know even though they've been long-standing members of a community they still may not have a vote to write or participate in democratic processes and so you know they lack that participatory parity in that sense and you know I think the way that Nancy Fraser describes this I think it really is a nice way of framing what a what a fair go would be you know what the which is another of those sort of classic New Zealand um values that we appeal to in our little imaginary community of New Zealand. <laughs> um, and I'll finish, I'll finish here, but just, I'll just, um, I'll just quickly touch on a few issues of, of um, my unease and my sense of dissatisfaction with the idea of Fair Borders Framework and, and what some of the possible problems with it. I think there's a problem of reification that by you know, bringing a moral value to justify a border regime that I'm just going and reifying and um, consolidating and reinforcing a, a regime of, of borders which is just intrinsically unfair and unjust um, to start off with and that there's a real danger that I'm sort of giving more power to the elbow of a, of a, um, of an unfair um, regime. Like, I certainly have my sympathies for the no borders concept, but I think of that as a more utopian ideal. Um, and whereas this is like a bit of a second best thing. So I guess I'm thinking while that reification is a problem, I guess I'm thinking of this as like by applying fairness to borders, you know, you might make a bad situation a little bit better. <laughs> um, and in a, in a way where there might be some actual progress, whereas, you know, arguing for a no borders utopia may well see very little progress anytime soon. Um, 
So, so those are just a few thoughts to throw up in the air. The other, another problem is, is opera, operationalization. I think I alluded to that a little bit about, you know, the fairness entails that we take, we take into consideration everybody's experiences and, um, and, and how they're affected by borders. And if that also entails an ethical obligation to explore the effects on people outside of the borders that you know becomes really complicated for for a government to actually achieve they're going to have to find some way of um understanding the effects on people who live outside of their borders um so that becomes a difficult thing to operate and the other problem is just of indeterminacy as i said like fairness is a slippery concept it means a lot of different things to different people and while that's kind of fun as a way to you know, push people on what fairness means for them, um, it also potentially leads to a problem where no one ever really is clear on what fairness actually means. And um, it just gets lost in, in disagreement on that terms. But I'll, I'll shut up now and um, I'd love to hear any points or problems or quibbles, please. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much, um, David, for you know a really interesting you know talk that's gone sort of high level political theory, but also given us some some substantive connections here. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess um, I've got a couple of questions I might ask, but I'll um, I'll open it up to um, to the floor to see maybe people outside of Auckland in the first Auckland University in the first instance. Jess, Natalie, Renee, and then I'll yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you, David. I'll say thanks first. <laughs> it's a really interesting talk and I think it's really interesting and quite fun in a way to think through those different alternatives right around closed, open, no borders or fair borders. Uh, and I don't really even know where to start <laughs> with, with my questions, to be honest, because there's so much to think through. Um, I don't know, I think my main questions, it is really that problem of operationalization for me of who would actually decide what is fair. Yeah. Uh, and what are, you know, there's that amount of tension that would arise around that. And I think in a, in a place like New Zealand, of course, we, we would also have to think about the place of Māori in the decision making around migration policy and so forth. How would that work? Um, I mean, you describe it as second best, and so you know it's, it sounds a bit like a reform rather than a revolution <laughs> yeah, yeah. scenario, right? And and I think in some ways I can see that what you're saying is like, well, at least something would happen rather than nothing. But I'm wondering, yeah, if it would in a way be better to just go for the full no borders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so more common, really, than a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I'm I'm sympathetic to that argument, and I guess I I feel that um, political theory and political thinking has like lots of different approaches, and there is a real value in making the no borders um, case. And I certainly don't think that I think that they should all operate and work alongside one another. Um, mm. But you know, there there is a, then again a strategic worry there that by you know, creating a sort of a third way, <laughs> for lack of a better term, that, um, you know, you sort of end up stalling the, the more radical um, conversation because you're sort of offering something which is somewhere in, in between and, um, and therefore you sort of get in the way of creating the possibility for something more radical. Um, yeah, and, and I, guess, I guess my only response to that is, yeah, I, I feel uneasy about that and I'm, and yeah, I'm certainly open to just canning the whole project <laughs> if I feel that um, if I feel that that's the if I feel that that is the outcome that it would have. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, that's perhaps not what I suggested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does remind me of, other, I think we do that quite often in society. It sort of reminds me of all sorts of other institutions where we were talking about school systems. Uh, well, I'm thinking of a German example where they do a similar thing of introducing a third way, uh, which is not going to work. Um, or something like, it sometimes reminds me of how we think about prisons. So it's something that's so ingrained and we think we couldn't possibly live without that institution and society and all kinds of reformers and so forth. But I think that's probably not the right way to go yeah. as an ana analogy to that. I'll let somebody else ask something. Yeah, else. I mean, it, it kind of stems from the methodology, I guess, which is why I felt the need to describe that at the start, because if I was to write something in the ideal theory method or the utopian sort of mode, then it would be something very different. 
Um, mm. So yeah, it's it's sort of it's it's sort of self constrained by that particular approach of political realism in a sense. Yeah. But but that that said, like political realists would say that it's worth pursuing a utopia if if that was was to be effective because often utopian thinking can really motivate people and mm. and push people for change and and that can be more effective and and motivating and compelling people than a than a sort of a third way proposal so um yeah political realism is not is not sort of closed to the possibility of utopian um arguments being being relevant mm. <laughs> I've got two questions and, yep. and, and one of them sort of um, sort of political theory. So I won't ask that for the time being, maybe later. Um, but the other one is, is maybe more precise to New Zealand. Um, you focused a lot on migration policy and I wonder what happens when you think of borders only mm -hmm. in terms of migration policy, even in the terms that you're talking about here. As you obviously no doubt know, borders are fundamental to colonialism as well, mm -hmm. right? So they yeah. are the establishment of a similar yeah. colony yeah, and yeah, everything yeah. that goes with that. Yeah. So when you have a claim that says, if fairness is acceptable to most people, then that's already entangled in yeah, the New yeah, Zealand yeah, yeah, context yeah. in the construction of a Brit Britain in the South Pacific and whatever else has taken place since then in the 19th and 20th centuries. Yeah. So how can fairness then be disentangled from being fundamentally a colonial project? I'm sure. <laughs> In the context. Yeah, it yeah, seems yeah, to me yeah, a lot yeah. of the authors you're citing here are, I might be wrong, I don't know the, exactly their institutional locations, but they're European yeah, more yeah, often. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the question of, of indigeneity is yeah. quite distinct and very, very different from, I mean, it has connections to colonialism as well, but totally in, in, a different sort of, in a different sort of way. Yeah. Can, in this context in New Zealand, can this be anything, can fairness be anything other than a colonial project? Um, yeah, my instinct is probably to say no, like I think, I think that's probably right. And I think it needs to be open to that, definitely. And I think like that's the, that's sort of part of the tension I think I'm finding with this because um, part of the, the advantage that it has in, in a sense of political leverage is to appeal to precisely the community that is um, the product so much of this colonial thinking, which, which takes the liberty of imposing borders and exercising borders and shutting out some people in relation to others, you know. So this is kind of a pitch precisely to a Pākehā mentality and a way to try and sort of persuade, um, yeah, this sort of sub-colonialist Pākehā mentality to, to say, well, even by your own values, the way that you're running borders at the moment are unfair. You know, they, they, don't, um, they don't stand by your own sort of colonial, sub-colonial kind of values. Um, so I think it is, it is an internal argument in that sense. And that is, I think, like why yeah, that is why I feel uneasy about this particular argument. But then that is kind of the, that's the necessary part of trying to make an ethical argument to that Pākehā majority who have the control over the migration policy and who vote in governments that, you know, run the, run migration policy and operate the borders in the way that they do now. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, like I'm sympathetic to other ways of understanding migration and movement and how we relate, um, you know, and like uh, a conception coming from Whakapapa, which would focus much more on the connections between communities rather than the way that communities are carved up and distinct from one another is, is really attractive. And again, like that would be a great thing to encourage. And I think these sorts of arguments could all operate together um to an extent but there is the problem the same problem that i talked about before where potentially a sort of a third way proposal of this nature would shut out it rather than allow it to happen and so yeah i i i, I completely see the problem there um and I'm, yeah i i guess my 
what I'm trying to get to here is that essentially there's a consideration here of political strategy, I think, um, driving this and why, why I'm focusing on an argument like this, because, yeah, it is still that Pākehā community that has their hands on the, on the levers of power. And um, which is the argument which is going to end up with the, um, you know, changing, even, even if it is the gentle reform and not the revolution, you know, which, which is, which is going to see the more progress here? And I guess I'm setting this up as, a, as, a, as that argument because, you know, perhaps that something like this would get more traction because, you know, it's a value that, yeah, Pākehā subs nominally subscribe to. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but I, might, I might be wrong, and, maybe, and maybe, the, maybe that sense of political strategy is wrong, and it would be much better to start with an Indigenous perspective and, and try to push that from, from another angle. But yeah, I would, I would hope that all of the, the different things could fit together. And, um, you know, I mean, Tahu and Arama in their chapter there, you know, had quite a nice way of saying, you know, here's this concept of fairness, which was a sort of loose brief, but, you know, actually... You know, we talk about it as tikka, and you know, what's tikka needs to be in line with Manaki Tanga. So, you know, there was a way for the arguments all to hang together a little bit. But um, that, that, yeah, I mean, whether or not that's not my place to say, that's really the place to say from a Kopa for Māori perspective as to whether the two can um, be consistent with one another or not. <laughs> I would like to follow up, and I agree with Francis' question. Yeah. But, um, first of all, thank you. Great topic. I think we should have more of an engagement with the foundational ideas, including our migration policies and even ideas of migration generally. So it's really good to have this opportunity. So thank you for raising a provocative set of questions and con concepts for us to think about. Um, having said that, I did have my first question was, I suppose, about the definition that you um, adopted, which is um, state of affairs, fairness of the state of affairs that is acceptable to most parties and like Francis, that sort of brings up every um, element of concern for the most parties and who's likely to be with most parties, especially when you're talking about minorities all mm. times. Yeah. Are they hardly likely to have much of a say um, in what is accepted eventually? Mm. So is that definition of itself a fair foundation for you to start your um, no, mm. concept from so we think that concept I don't know um, the other thing that seemed to strike me was that you're interested in this idea of fairness as a procedural concept you said yeah um, what would be the sets of procedures that would make a debate or policies on migration fairer of, of fair um, and I wondered if more um, more time or, or, or should be spent on trying to um, unravel what that means, so in, including who ought to be present, how do you ensure that mm. people are present, is there a right of appeal, or mm. if their board is one where you can appeal to and influence, um, and I wondered if those sorts of criteria would actually help to open up the notion of fairness a little bit more, especially since you're focused on procedural dimension of it. Yeah. You also talked about fairness being um, in relation to all those who are affected, of, um, uh, affected, those who are inside, outside, and across. Um, it's good to recognize the interconnectedness of borders and people who are on both sides and across, and, um, and it's important. Nancy Fraser talks about this notion of all rather than rather than all who are affected, mm. she talks about all, all subjected. Who are subjected, yeah, yeah, yeah. which includes not just people who are just around the borders, inside, outside, but those who are quite far away and removed and removed yeah. from the very process. And in a globally interconnected world, the notion of subjection or subjective, not quite subjective, to those who are subjected to, um, is perhaps more relevant. Mm. Um, yeah, and we know now that one of the top reasons why people migrate is for ecological environmental reasons and that's going to exacerbate in years to come. Yeah. So those who are subjected is going to be all the more remote and we can expect those kinds of changes to be impacting us here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do we start to even factor in subject those who are subjected into this framework of fairness, I wonder. Um, also it seemed to me that your concepts of fairness 
revolved around human actors. Whereas I wonder to what extent we need to also consider in an ecologically fragile, fragile world, non-human actors as well. Mm. Um, because it's not just about people moving here. It could be about oil exploration, which is also you know, in the cards at the moment and who's coming here to explore our, our shores. Yeah. Um, and have I, have I exhausted my time? <laughs> no, go for it. No, they're all great points. They're, I'm, I'm laughing it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you want to distinguish between fairness and justice, and I particularly myself am partial to Iris Marie Young's notion of justice in the 1990 book, which must have yeah. uh, predated Karen's um, notion, and there, there are similarities there. Uh, your example of Caitlin, the little girl, for instance, seems to be a case of justice, not fairness. Mm. Because it's not, it's justice because there's no of reason apart from justice and a sort of morality associated with justice to want to keep her in the country. Mm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's a question uh, of justice, I think, and how it's different from the fairness you propose. It would be good to have a more fine, refined notion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, because they seem to both um, want to appeal to the morality of a situation. Yeah. Um, and also, I think, picking up on Jessica's point, now, since your ideas are grounded in political realism, should you or should we not debate these within a more concrete um, role of, a uh, concrete understanding of the role of history? Mm. And to what extent does that play almost as a, you know, a, a textured analysis of how we understand fair borders today, here, now. Mm. Um, and it would be good to see that history reflected as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, no, I, as I said, that's a great bunch of points. Um, I'm not sure if I should be going through all of them. No, and, uh, no, they're just thoughts that came to my mind. Yeah, I mean, they're all immensely valuable. Um, I mean, so, so, some of these, uh, like the, you know, the historical thing, I completely agree. Um, it's just only so many things I can do in one little yes. seminar, but, but there's certainly something if, if I choose to write this up as a, as a paper, then, um, then that's something to address at that point. Um, and the, yeah, the issue around justice and fairness, you know, there's definitely a whole lot of overlaps and there, are, you know, I'm very sympathetic to Iris Marion Young's work as well. Um, and yeah, there's there's a big sort of Venn diagram really where the you know the conception sort of you know there's a ideas of imperfect justice which start to look a lot more like what I was describing as fairness and then you know in Rawls's hands there's a conception of fairness which starts to look a lot more like perfect justice and yeah it's 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 a big landscape to orientate yourself within um, some of the yeah and and the and the Nancy Fraser point thanks for that I just have forgotten to put that in but you're absolutely right and that's kind of what I was thinking of yeah the subject had been the more important subset within the affected mm -hmm. so yeah no absolutely right um and yeah the operationalization point I think is absolutely right I think the more you start to think through how these actually start to look as institutions then um the more helpful it is to see the potential problems that are created by the by the sort of normative conception, but I guess you know this is one of the it's it's one of the um, shortcomings I guess of normative political theory generally that like you know it is a lot of this abstract theorizing and then you know most people in my profession never ever get around to trying to institutionalize it you know and thinking through what those implications are which I think is a massive lapse and um, you know I've tried to do that a lot more at least in climate policy but um it would be really valuable to think through that. And I think, again, that's something to do probably once I develop the paper a bit more thoroughly and then start to try to dig down into what that might look like. Um, and yeah, it might well look like something a little bit ugly and, um, and something that, or, or at least, I mean, I guess my major fear I think would be that whatever institutions were created to try and implement this would be problematic for the reasons that you precisely mentioned around how, how would you represent you know a notion of fairness or other values for minorities when the definition is around this yeah what's acceptable to most parties there's this majoritarian bias to fairness in the way that i've described it here and um 
it may well be that whatever institutions were to stem out of something like that would reify that bias and, and would struggle to get out of it. And that would be, I guess, exactly the kind of outcome which would make me um, take this paper out and um, throw it in the bin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And yeah, if, if it couldn't get around that tension, if it couldn't get around that paradox, then it wouldn't be worth pursuing, really. And, and, it, and it may well be that that is, and, and maybe, maybe then that's an interesting falsification of, <laughs> of, of, a, of a value or something, or a falsification of this particular method. But it's a valuable uh, paper and it's valuable to be able to debate this. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Checking for others. I, 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 I just want to just, in a sense, follows up on your response to Rachel there. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if part of the challenge comes in, in your, your focus on fairness as morality. Mm. And you've interchanged between morals and ethics here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, a yeah, high-level yeah. political question that yeah, 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 I'm yeah. not really equipped to ask myself. But, but it does strike me that that slippage between morals and ethics is where some of the problems potentially enter into this, right? Morals, at least how I would read them, kind of Nietzsche and I guess are how things ought to be. They involve judgment. Mm. Yeah? And in this instance, judgment is the judgment of the most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's interesting. We reflected on those terms. Ethics is, I guess, what can a body do or what can things do? Mm. Yeah, we might ask questions in quite different kinds of ways about borders if we were concerned with their ethics. Yeah, because we would say even now today they allow certain things, bodies, objects, non-human beings to do things, and others not to do things, mm. and they, in that sense, produce a certain kind of societal arrangement and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what would it look like if one started, it made that kind of distinction between morals and ethics? Mm. Would you still sit on the, on the, on the side of morals and saying, well, we'll look at fairness because I do think that's a value. So it does sit on the question of judgment. It does sit on the question of morality or one would, would one look at a question of ethics where the whole issue of openness and closeness starts to look a little bit different mm. because the openness and closeness is not about one or the other. It's about, again, what the impacts are on particular bodies, what, do they, what does a border allow one to do or disallow one to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know that's kind of abstract <laughs> and high level, but it does, does strike me that there's a, there's a connection here and the way, you know, and the, the question is all the range of points that, that Rachel's raising in your response to them, that morality seems almost like, it seems a problem here because it's always ought to do. It's always mm -hmm. a judgment. Um, and I wonder whether ethics is a, would be a place that might, that things would look a bit different. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to try to, yeah, make a sort of similar distinction when I use moral versus ethics. Like I tend to, I mean, so some of this, you know, moral remainders is a, is a term. So I kind of go with the way that it's described in that context. And I guess I'm usually thinking of, of morals as, yeah, as you say, that more normative, abstract, ought language, um, yeah, and ethics, the sort of lived, lived version of it, the slightly more sociological side of it. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if I've wavered out of that distinction in, in my paper. I might, I might have. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of where to pick up on your point. I mean, it is. A, I mean, there's no easy resolution to it. I mean, hence no, no, no. Have it offer us something and, that and, looks And different. I guess again, it comes down to that question of institutionalization. It's you know, this is quite in that moral domain. Mm. This whole paper and its and its you know approach, even even its sort of claims to political realism, it's still a still a sort of theoretical um, exercise. Would, um, would you then need to grapple with what the already existing moralities of borders are in relation to migration policy? Could that be another way of doing this? Because you're saying, well, what is fairness? Well, part of that, and you, you know, again, it sits in the background, I suppose, but as a more, you know, forward or foregrounded sort of um, critique of existing moralities, the existing moralities is one must be a productive mm. economic subject and not 
ill, you know, ill or having, you know, any kind of um, disablement of any kind, right? Yeah, yeah, For yeah. example, on the example you gave, you know, if that critique is upfront more, then is it possible to, you know, put attention between those two things? Yeah, yeah, Different yeah. Different kinds of judgment, because both are judgments. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, yeah, that's, that's a good point. There's ethics and there's also Pitanga. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. can't escape that too. So exactly. then they all three fit in together. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I mean, it just—it's just sort of. I, I guess it emphasizes that notion that that this isn't. It was sort of what we were talking about before. This is a pitch to a certain community, which mm -hmm. doesn't represent the entire, you know, peoples and and communities and worldviews that exist within New Zealand and that is it's that is a sort of tension and then it's potential political strategic advantage but um yeah those two are they're, they're uncomfortable considerations to hang in with one another but yeah I think I think it's really valuable to to tease out these <laughs> these aspects of it because um it seems always the case really uh, these sorts of ways of talking about borders are always there's always this tension of the proposal of the way you know of how you are going to interrupt people's lives you know essentially what and you know under what ways and what strategies are you you know when you're talking about a theory of a border in that sense it's really um it's quite alarming <laughs> but the problem is it goes on all the time you know and it goes on in an unthought through way as well i mean like yeah, I mean, I say that this is a very theoretical exercise, but then, you know, there are notions of open and closed borders which are in operation in MB, which are having a massive effect on people's lives, and they're not thinking that through in that term. They're just inhabiting and, um, yeah, and expressing these concepts and these normative conceptions that, 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 that have just been, yeah, adopted in an unthinking kind of unconsidered way, um, considered and thought through at some point, but not necessarily by the people that are implementing the policy. Um, and I guess that's the, you know, that's the other sort of question of political strategy is which is the best way to interfere with the normative conceptions which are currently driving um, migration policy, you know, is it, you know, which are the, you know, proposing another normative conception is one way to potentially interrupt and disrupt those patterns of thinking which are currently shaping the border policy and having a proactive alternative of this nature is potentially one way, but it need not be the only one. So to some extent, you also to clarify what the current normative um, framing of... Yeah, yeah, that would be a really helpful. Because yeah. it, there's, no, there's no universalized notion of fair borders. It's, there's only a fair border conception for now yeah. in this time and place. Sometimes that shifts from government to government. Sometimes it shifts during the era or period of a particular government. Mm. Um, but if your objective is to offer a critique, you have to have a sense of what is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that might be, as you were saying, part of the new liberal project. You know, and that might be the yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I could do a lot worse than starting with some of your work on this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, your paper on this is, you know, it's, it sits in the back of my mind with these things. So it probably is informing it, but I haven't spelled it out. And I think that would be really valuable. So thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You're no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> can I, can I pick for other questions? Well, um, then it's up to me to um, to thank you, David, for, um, you know, as, as we've said here already, introducing a, a concept which shifts our way of thinking and has obviously challenged us to ask some, you know, high level and also complex sort of grounded questions about how, the, how fair borders might look. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for being part of the seminar. Our next uh, seminar um, is from uh, Camille Nakid, who will be giving a talk um, in relation to the work that she has done with um, African youth in New Zealand and their in encounters with police. Um, so very much a grounded account of understanding, I guess, some of the power and politics that come inside of borders or when borders are internalized. Um,